Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. If you're a chief executive, or if you think like one, and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve extraordinary results. And no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Today, I speak with Alex Cheetle, who is the CEO of 10 Lifestyle Group. 10 is a company uh, aimed at providing the most trusted service to individuals around the world, providing concierge services to make their life better, provide them with intelligent support for making all the fun things, restaurants, theaters, sports, reservations, uh, easy uh, and low effort. Uh, Alex is really on a mission to create a trusted business, to uh, make something that's world-class, um, to build something that's high-tech and also high-touch. And I think you'll find this is a fascinating conversation. You'll discover why Alex received a standing ovation for firing somebody, the mistakes he made when it came to motivating his team, and just the overall scope and passion that he brings to his ambition is incredibly motivating. So sit back and enjoy this conversation with Alex Cheetle of 10 Lifestyle Group. Hi, Alex, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Alex, you've got a great track record. You founded your business, 10 Lifestyle Group, in 1998. And I know you've now grown it to almost a 1,000 staff over 24 offices. So today, I'd love to really dive into that journey of CEO of a business which started off as probably one of you or a couple of you. And you know, you're now this global... Uh, lifestyle business, uh, concierge business. Um, really keen to find out what what the highs and lows of that journey have been. Perhaps before we start, would you just kind of give me, yeah, just the, give the listeners that 20,000 foot view, uh, what's the business and what, what prompted you to found it? Why did you start? So the, the business is about helping people get the best from their lives. So we organize their travel and their dining and their eating out, uh, playing out, music, theatre, sport, uh, and all sorts of other things. Very personalised service, and we aim to be the most trusted service business in the world. But back in 98, I took a sabbatical from Procter & Gamble, where I was a, a kind of brand manager there. And I started travelling around the world with a backpack and an A4 notebook, thinking, what business do I want to set up? Because I knew I wanted to set up a business. And I started off thinking, what business is going to make the most money? And quite quickly, I realized that the businesses that were going to be the easy ways, the easiest ways, the best ways to make the most money didn't speak to me. So I thought, stop thinking about what's going to be the most successful for, um, for your bank balance and think about what's going to be the most successful for you. So I came up with five criteria for the business I wanted to set up. And I wanted a business that was going to change the way the world worked in some positive way. Mm -hmm. So it had to be big and it had to be uh, new. And then I wanted a business that played to uh, what I thought was one of my defining strengths, which is that I'm good at complexity. So I wanted a business that needed to be complicated. And then I thought, um, and don't, don't dig too deeply on this, the psychologist in you might want to find out why, but um, I still haven't <laughs> quite, quite discovered it. I decided it had to pass the Alex Cheetle pub test, which is that you're in a pub or a bar and when somebody asks you what you do, you're proud and they are interested. And that pub okay. test is still something I think about every six months or so. Is that still true? And happily, it is. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted a business where I would be forced to recruit through the logic of the business model, people that I would really enjoy working with and get that sense of shared endeavor with good people mm -hmm. that, uh, that really makes business fun. So, so then the thinking was... Um, uh, let's have a big idea. And the big idea ended up being how can we set up the world's most trusted service? Because that looks big and new and difficult and mm. something that people could commit to and something I could be proud of and other people would be interested in. And we said to set up the world's most successful business, a uh, successful service, I should say, um, we're going to want to deal with individuals 
Uh, we're going to want to be paid uh, to deliver great service. So we don't want to make commission off the back end. Otherwise, you end up just selling stuff to people rather than serving them. Uh, we decided not immediately, but after a while, that we'd want to focus on the top end uh, people that were earning 100,000 a year plus through to very wealthy people because you've got two sides of a marketplace and they can afford, frankly, great service that the mass market maybe, maybe can't. Um, we were going to need to invest in technology because we thought the only way we can deliver fantastic service efficiently and well is by becoming great at tech and using that to personalize to the individual and to streamline the business and so on. But at the same time, we'd want to let people deal with human beings, very unfashionable in 98, um, when they want to. It is in some ways. Yeah, yeah. So, so many businesses uh, don't want to, to hire people. They want to have um, servers in the old days, uh, as much stuff in the cloud as possible today. Whereas we, we always thought the world's best service business would be a hybrid between technology and people. Um, well, if I just slow you down on that, yeah. it's, it's, it resonates with me. Obviously, I have a different sort of service business, right? Working with execs and leaders and teams of different sorts. But I have a mantra, which is high tech and high touch. Yes. And it's kind of that balance of the tech and the human. You know, I believe in um, the high touch. You know, I think in a world where everyone's trying to do things at scale, actually, the super personalized service is, is powerful and, and transformative. But there's also a place for technology. It can make a lot of things work more smoothly, give you a fantastic experience you know and when you bring those things together magic happens. possibilities yeah new possibilities emerge that, that's right and uh, a friend of mine who's a big tech entrepreneur i once said to him what's the difference between a tech business and a non-tech business he said tech businesses love spending money on tech and most other businesses resent it and we're, we're definitely a tech business by that measure we we think it's completely central to the vision mm -hmm. uh for the business and frankly you know every we, we've never run out of ideas for what we can uh, spend money on tech where it helps our members and helps us deliver better service more efficiently. So, um, so that was really important. The, the final thing I'd say about our business, I uh, wanted to be the most trusted service business in the world. You can't be the most trusted service business in the world if all you do is organize weddings or help people buy cars because people only get married hopefully once or twice in their life and people only buy a car hopefully every few years. We wanted to have a breadth and this played to the complexity thing, we wanted to start by saying to people, what do you want? And then we would make sure that we could help them in as many different areas as, as possible so that we got that regularity of contact that really breeds trust. Mm. So we came back, we set the business up with private members, and then quite quickly we discovered that banks in particular, but also other luxury brands and, uh, and other brands that have got an ongoing relationship with their customers, would pay us to look after their top customers. Right, yeah. And then we realized that if we went to restaurants and said, if we fill you, if we can fill you up with um, people that show up on time and then spend twice as much as the average, will you give us guaranteed seating and access that you don't give to the public? And after many years, they said, yes. And then we went to uh, the kind of people that sell Ed Sheeran tickets and own venues and so on and said, if we guarantee you that real people um, come along to your venue and they're, pay and they're paying, you know, £80 for an Ed Sheeran ticket um, and that we've sold it to them for £80 and we buy it from you for £80, will you give us lots of access for those tickets, whether it's for the ballet or rock, pop, music, sport? And they say, well, you, you must be mad not to want to make a margin inside or by adding on. But yes, of course, we make our money from subscription, so we don't need to. And then in travel, we'd say to hotels, if we book you in, if we book our members in, if your hotel's right for them, um, will you give them uh, early check-in, late check-out, upgrades, and so on? And, and we've really followed the logic of that subscription business model through. So we're now, as far as we know, the largest subscription travel business in the world, which puts us on the right side of our membership. Um, and we've got millions of eligible members. And in a normal year, hundreds and thousands of wealthy people all over the world will use our service and we've become global and uh, we are the best in the world of what we do, but hopefully uh, getting better every few months as well. I, I love the, um, I love this focus you had on the aligning the incentives, right? I mean, the point that the 80 pound ticket is 80 pounds, right? And it, and you're not making commission on those things, um, but you're selling the services as, as, you know, as a, as a subscription. 
I think it's really important to get those incentives aligned. It's like one of those things like, you know, you get, you get it aligned at the start and then everything else I think becomes easier because you're not always having this to and fro tension in the system. I see it in my own business, you know, um, some coaches and consultants sell things by the hour. And I'm like, well, that for me, that totally distorts the incentives, you know, um, actually everybody, you know, the client actually wants the least amount of like the highest return in the least amount of time. Mm. Um, you know, actually everybody wants that, right. Everybody wants a fantastic result fast. Um, and on the other hand, when you do need help, you don't want to always feel that you're picking up the, you know, the meter's going to start to tick every time you, you want something. So, you know, if every time I want a, a bit ticket, I'm not, don't necessarily want to start putting the meter on something. Whereas if you yes. pay up front, you commit to the, the idea, the service, and then you enjoy it. Absolutely right. And I mean, back, this was essential for when we set the business up in 98, I was out in San Francisco and Yahoo had just been valued at a billion dollars. And people were astonished. And I thought, my God, I can see how technology is going to be used. It's going to be used to, to because you can atomize data down to the individual. Companies like my old company, Procter & Gamble, are going to use that to sell stuff to people and manipulate them even more than we already do through TV advertising. And I thought, that's going to be a great business. And I definitely don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> I think it's rotten and awful. And, uh, and of course, it turned out not to be Procter & Gamble that did that. It was Google and Facebook. Yeah. And, you know, their, their, their problems, clearly, their success stems from their business model. But their kind of ethical conflicts... Uh, also stem from the same business model. And we were determined right from the start to not have to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. And when we Beautiful. have had to choose between our ethics and our business model, we've chosen our ethics. Mm. Yeah. Really interesting. So what's the, so I'm my mind thinking, I had a conversation with a, with a client just today, really the same thing, right? Saying he runs a tech um uh, business and he said this is the same thing like you know we we really want to stand almost in opposition against some of the big tech you know and actually stand for a different way of doing tech so you you're just kind of setting bells off in my mind as we go here but let's kind of take the focus back onto you this is about ceo success factors so what's um what are a couple of the key factors that have driven you know your success driving building this business i mean if i mean i know you've had to probably put your finger on a number of pies but what do you think is kind of core to your own leadership approach or how you've built things obviously I've heard you've laid some great foundations with the business model but then as you got into the scaling of that business what what's driven that so we've we've got we've had loads of mistakes and a few things we've got right. And some of the things we've got right is we've, we've stuck with that vision of wanting to be the most trusted service business and made some quick decisions that could have been difficult um, led by that, 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 that original vision and those, those sets of values. Um, it also, because we've always talked about the meaning in the business, it's allowed us to attract really good people that get committed to what we're doing. So we've had a lot of loyalty from very high quality mm -hmm. people. And uh, I was talking with my finance director two days ago about somebody else that we hope we're joining our leadership team. And I said, she's going to have to take a bit of a pay cut because this, this individual is extremely good at what she does. And he said, well, I took a, I took a 30% pay cut to join the business. And so-and-so took a 20% pay cut. So-and-so took a 30% pay cut. And all these people, I think, are very well paid and they'll do, should do super well out of their options as well. But it's quite interesting that people are willing Yep. to take a cut to join us because we're not just trying to make as much money as possible. We're trying to improve the way the world works. And that drives us as a team and always has done. I, I think it's so important. I, I mean, I always say that, that finance is the fuel. I mean, fundamentally, money is not the end in itself. For no. me, we talk, this is the impact multiplier podcast, right? It's not the money multiplier. I mean, I think it's great to, mod you know, it's great to multiply the money. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, what are we doing with this money, right? And how is it actually feeding through? So I'm all for great financials. But I think if you don't have that sense of how are we actually contributing and making the world a better place, like you, management has to become so tactical almost and yeah. uh, kind of carrot and stick. Whereas if you have something which draws people to you, you know, a vision that people actually are committed to, it all just becomes so much easier. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I'm really proudest of is that uh, the culture in the business, 
people know what a 10 person is. It's somebody that's values led, does the right thing, is open, honest, upfront, um, really quite unpolitical. Because again, you mm. don't need politics if you've got if you're if your values driven. And there's always a bit, but um, but you can have far less. And 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 our people are kind of undefensive. People will say, "Well, let's involve Richard in this. He's much better than me at that." And conversations like that are really common in uh, ten, the way that they're not in in many other companies. So, how did you do that? How did you, what did you do to create that culture? It always comes from the top, right? I think it's by modelling it, um, and then also by who we've hired and who we've very occasionally fired. And the very first person I had to fire, we were 30 individuals in a serviced office that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like a WeWork, put it that way. It was kind of just about habitable. And we had hired this guy who had joined alongside uh, two other people. And he was bullying the people that joined in with him. And I had to take him down. We didn't have a meeting room. We used the lobby of the hotel next door. So I had to take him down to the hotel lobby and fire him. And then I thought, I'm going to come back upstairs to my rather fragile startup. The dot-com boom was running out of speed at this time. It was kind of uh, beginning of or end of 2000. And I thought people are going to be freaked out that I've made, that I fired somebody so, uh, so brutally and suddenly who's only 10 days into their job. And I said why I'd fired him and explained it to the business and got a standing ovation, which I was not expecting. I thought they'd be anxious and threatened by it. Actually, they were delighted because it just validated our values. And everybody had spotted this guy as a standout problem person for our culture. And it's in moments like that that really sets the culture, but also stops the culture becoming toxic. The most likely way I think that I would spoil our culture is by hiring somebody who had exactly the right skill set to do a job we needed doing and just ignoring that they didn't quite have the right values. and that is when you've let the rot set in i think yeah yeah exactly that's the temptation isn't it it's like performance over over values and i always thought you know say in a business there's there's performance there's behavior which is really values you know and then there's learning you know and how do you optimize between these three parts on the triangle um because you know if you over rotate on short-term performance then you say you create toxicity, perhaps if the you know, behaviors start to go awry, you know, and yeah. and also learning, because if you want to be a learning organization, that involves messing up, that involves experimenting, and that might involve taking a short-term hit. Whereas in, cult- in a culture which says, oh, we're so performance driven, okay, but do you have room for adaptation and growth? Yes, absolutely um, right. I, I completely agree with you on that. It's like, as I like to say, it's like, you know, um, you know, we used to think of businesses as machines, but they're more like organisms because they need to adapt and grow and change. You know, and even like today's best phone, it's the highest performance device you can buy, and it's obsolete really quickly because it's kind of it's it's been optimized for performance. You know, under a certain fixed <laughs> set of rules. So, um, so I, lo- I love your the whole thing around. Yeah, getting that that idea of the ten person, right? The the values led uh, individual, not being political, not being defensive, yeah, and having that vision, and really making decisions based on that. Um, what about the dark sides? Like you know, it's part of you know your leadership style, obviously being very values driven, visionary, sitting those things out. You know, what are things that you've had to kind of I don't know, mistakes you've made on the journey or, you know, a bit of a dark side that you're always having to kind of think about. Am I keeping this part of me in check? Does something come to mind? So, yeah, uh, quite a few things. Um, I would say that something that took me years and years and years to learn is that motivating other people is very different from motivating myself. I'm very, very well motivated by fear of failure. Mm. So the way to get myself operating well is to imagine it all falling over and I find that motivates me brilliantly I think well under that kind of pressure Mm. and so for many years I would try to inspire that fear of failure in my people sometimes particularly at crunch times and uh, I now realize that that works for about 
well, I don't know if it's even 15% of normal people. Um, and most people think best and are most committed when they're positively motivated rather than mm. negatively motivated. It took me so long to learn that. Um, uh, and I'm still learning it. I think I've kind of internalized it well, but not completely to this day. Um, so that's definitely one thing that if I went back in time as the leader I am now, I think I'd do a better job for that reason. Um, I think... Actually, and just, can I just ask yeah. on that question? What's the impact when you try to motivate people by pointing at the failure, failure risk? Well, look, short term, it works. Um, so in the moment, it sets up urgency, uh, commitment, um, I think what it damages is a lot of people's brains stop thinking um, when they're under attack and they feel under attack. You're wanting to show them a shared problem and get them excited about solving it because if we don't, we're, we're screwed. Um, what they feel is attacked and their brain shut down. So it yeah. lights my brain up, but it shuts down many other good people's. So... That's something that I've, I've had to learn. And uh, it's something I wish I'd known. And even when I learned it intellectually, I wish I'd sat with it properly and actually internalized it into how I operated under pressure. Um, that was one of my big learnings. I think other things that, that I've learned kind of uh, that, that cost us, um, Delegation is really interesting. So I'm not somebody that thinks that, you know, um, delegation in itself is a brilliant thing. It's for me, you've got to have the right people in place to delegate to. And many startup entrepreneurs shouldn't delegate because they don't yet have a team of people they can delegate to. They should own it all. And most successful entrepreneurs I know were very poor delegators um, uh, when they first set their business up. And quite right, too. That's a model of success. Um, if you don't have talented people to delegate to. Uh, but learning how to delegate uh, and learning, learning how to get people up to speed so you can delegate effectively is really important because I've certainly have historically gone from not delegating because I didn't trust my people um, to, delegate, to, to manage some of the things I wanted to delegate through to hiring people who could do what I wanted them to do and then not briefing them properly, delegating too early, saying, well, this person's done this hundreds of times before, should be fine, and that not working either. So I think I've got better, still not brilliant at it, but I think much better at learning what I need to do so that I can empower people and delegate to them earlier. Um, although I do think I always was willing, in fact, enthusiastic about hiring people that were better than me. Mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that people knew how good they were in the organization um, and what they were best at uh, so that other people can also have that trust and they can then delegate to them as well, or at least work with them with that, with that real trust. I find the entrepreneur who can't grow his business past 30 people, it's quite often because they don't allow other people to be leaders in their business and uh, i hope that's not been the case for for us hello it's richard here with a quick interlude these conversations are all about upgrading how you think about creating impact so here's a resource to help you do just that whilst staying fast and focused the ceo's checklist for challenging times is a quick way to enhance your thinking and detect blind spots, even when things are moving incredibly fast and you're not sure what's going to happen next. You can get this powerful checklist of 17 world-class strategies by heading to xquadrant.com forward slash go forward slash challenging times checklist with a hyphen between each of those three last words. Now, back to the conversation. Well, I guess at a thousand people, you've definitely broken that barrier. <laughs> I definitely have now, yes. Yeah, perfect. So motivating and, and then and delegating, I mean, they're, they're kind of interesting. In some sense, they're 
they're parts of the same issue, right? They're part of the, they're part of the same thing. Um, you, know, you talked about fear of, fa fear of failure. I think the thing is actually three things, right? There's fear of failure. I mean, people are often, I think, motivated either by, as you said, the positive side, like achievement. I think fear of failure is the flip side of that. And then there's also kind of the whole um, learning part as well. So other people are, you know, are motivated by that. And I think um, probably everybody has their own default setting. And I think it is a great point that you made that you know, what motivates us isn't going to motivate everybody else necessarily. Yeah. Um, and then I, I think around the delegation, I think the point that I'm hearing in what you're saying there is, yeah, it's really important to to master that handoff, right? In terms of setting the context. I like to say to my clients, like, make sure you have, like, what's a success checklist? If I'm going to, if you've delegated this thing to somebody, imagine that they don't even come, ever come back to you. I just email you with a quick report, you know, with a few bullet points. Like, I say, what has to be true? What do you need to read in that email for you to go, oh, that's great. If that's true, I don't even need to look at the finished product. Mm. And like, what are those success criteria? which basically when you go, okay, that's fine. If we did it like this to this budget on this time and this person was involved and these people like it and this was the outcome, then I don't need, don't need to know anymore. And that's quite a good way of yes, that can kind be of pointing it down to the essentials, like what would actually make you happy? What outcome would actually satisfy you? Mm. you know, and some people, it might be like, we only need to use two fonts in the presentation. I mean, whatever it is, make sure it's clearly articulated because if you don't articulate it now, you would articulate it when it comes back to you <laughs> and there's five you know five different fonts and different sizes or whatever in the presentation so well i think that clear articulation is something which i absolutely recognize that, that that's been crucial for us when we've done well and it's also been one of the main reasons when we haven't grown as quickly as we could have done it's from not articulating things clearly enough yeah so we would I, i'm I'm one of those people that, you know, when I wash up uh, a me you know, after a meal, doing the dishes or whatever, I'll wash up almost everything. I'll normally leave a couple of things in the sink. And the problem with that when you're writing a brief is that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll explain 90% of what I want, but not 10%. Um, and today, I'm closer to 99%. And historically, I was closer to only explaining 80% of what we right. wanted to do. And then you'd wonder why people hadn't delivered or had waste, maybe wasted a bit of time building something that wasn't necessary or whatever. And that's certainly something I've got better at, still haven't solved, but I'm, I'm on a journey, as they say, about that as well. Just actually trying to force myself to get clear um, rather than just put down some parameters and then hope that people uh, uh, mm. can can get the rest out, out of it, you know, just yeah. by guessing. Yeah, it's like you know, you're drawing the boundary conditions, right, or drawing the frame, saying you know, anything within this is going to be okay, but these need to be true. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, very fascinating. So let's kind of go into the future a little bit. Um, what's next for the business? I said you you said you were coming. You're 24 offices. You're coming up to a uh, thousand people, not not far off. You know, what's going to be different if we were talking in two or three years? So I think I think we I think we're already the best way in the world to um, organize meals out and uh, music, theater and sport all over all over the world. And I and we're very good at travel as well. But I think we're going to get much better than anybody else in the market. It's a bold claim, but I think we will be by quite some way the best place to organize um, travel, dining, uh, you know, many lifestyle, most lifestyle things. And the reason is that because we've got this subscription revenue stream, we get paid to do what we're doing. We can then just completely focus on working with the supplier base that we need, whether it's restaurants or hotels or whatever else, to get the right results. So once that's married up with tech, it allows us to personalize and scale it and deliver it through really good UX, UI. Um, then the world's our oyster. What I've realized over the years is that companies that make all their money off the back end, whether it's a retailer with a markup or whether it's um, a travel agent that's making an inside commission of you know, 15, 20% on most holidays, um, in the end, they can't move to our model. You know, If the world's best uh, travel agents today had to declare the margin they made on their holidays for their top customers, they'd be bust in a week. Um, 
and we don't we haven't built with that kind of history of dark secrets um and so that means that we've been we've we've gone a different evolutionary route very difficult for other people to copy us mm. so i think we are accelerating into our marketplace and that the world for um the world's top two percent let's say so households earning up more than a hundred thousand a year um you know they're 50 percent of the world's travel they're something like 80 percent of the world's fine dining there's something like 50 percent of the world's uh, concert tickets hmm. that that's a huge multi-trillion pound market yeah. um, and we're in it and we think we've taken an evolutionary route to do very well in it and it gets better with scale got it so so how's that good so as you do that um how you know and, and the business continues to grow and you've gone to these extra areas you do go into the market how are you going to need to change as a leader right so i'm sure you've had various various evolutions in the last uh 20 years uh or more you know wh where are you where do you think you'll need to go now where's where's your growth edge if you like where's your opportunity to to shift how you operate i i think i'll spend longer on recruitment and making sure that we keep the culture by recruiting the right people in into leadership positions in the business i think i'm going to have to spend longer communicating and using interesting and different means to do that. And I'm, I'm excited by that and frustrated by it as well. Um, I'd like to be able to just say it once and have everyone understand it. But I think what we've learned is that you've got to say it in different ways to different people for an organization to understand what they're all about. And the best gift you can give as a leader to a business is clarity of purpose. Mm. Um, and then many of them will have to then be clear about the parameters on a particular project. Uh, so I think we're going to have to get better at that. I think also, you know, in the end, I was brought up in a very kind of middle class household. My mum was a secretary. My stepdad was a, a school teacher. Um, one of the things that I have to battle is intellectually, I'm extremely ambitious, um, but I don't come from a background where I expected to just, you know, be running the world. And I've got to be, and I'm not planning on running the world um, <laughs> okay. but i am planning on having a wildly successful business and i find that i have to uh remind myself and help myself believe that actually this organization that i'm giving my life to and will give my my, my working life to is you know can be one of the world's greats and, uh, you know, that's something which I've always believed intellectually because the logic of our business model and how we execute it lends itself to that. But you've also got to somehow believe it inside yourself. Um, you know, I've always been struck. I think carp, is it carp that grow to be as big as they are, depending on the size of the pool that they think they're in? Right. And, um, you know, I've got to keep raising my own ambitions for my business to succeed without becoming a narcissistic lunatic at the top of a business so you've got to grow your ambitions and your self-belief whilst remaining wide open to the very real truth that you are imperfect and often wrong yeah That's exactly it. it's yeah it's not drinking the whole ceo kool-aid right the, because yeah. often when, when you're in that position as the founder you get a lot of respect and you know adulation and various things and it's kind of being grounded whilst being ambitious right it's, it's the game and i mean i think for me one of the ways that i see people do that is by expanding their ambition to serve right so you know in terms of like how more you know how can we have a bigger positive impact right how can we actually make people's lives way more mm -hmm. you know fulfilling or satisfying or whatever it is that you're doing in the business yeah, yeah, because it kind of takes takes the it off that kind of own the you know the ambition of oh look how big you know my empire is becoming, but you shift it to look how many people we're actually impacting. Yes, um, so I think that's absolutely right. We've we've recently launched um, a uh, uh, a plan that takes out to twenty thirty, and rather predictably, it's called ten. Obviously, the business 10, 10 20, 30. You could you could see it tripping off the tongue, and that's all about. Um, obviously, what do we want to do? But why do we want to do it? How do we want to do it? Um, and that's super important because then 
other people can take and can make the decisions in that context. And part of my job is just to help express what we're trying to do to attract the right talent and then for other people to make the right decisions. Whereas maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have been making a much higher proportion of the decisions in the business. Mm. So what, let's just go forward then. It'd be a great place to perhaps end. You know, you're in 2030. Um, what's going to be the most satisfying part of that for you? What would be what what would be the outcome? What would you be looking at that will give you the biggest sense of achievement? Do you know the most satisfying thing. So we say by 10, 20, 30, we'll have three million people using our service regularly. Um, the most satisfying thing is that from three million people using our service regularly, getting to 10 million people using our service regularly should be relatively straightforward. So I think what's most exciting about 10, 20, 30 is 10, 20, 40. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out how old I'll be by then. Anyway, um, I'm sure they'll find something for me to do <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'm no longer the chief exec at that point. Perfect. Well, hey, and it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you much, uh, so much for sharing. Um, if people want to find out more about um, you or, or, or 10 uh, Lifestyle Group, where do they go? 10lifestylegroup.com uh, uh, is the website. And there, there's videos on there and there's case studies and there's all sorts of things. And we are always on the lookout for fantastic talent as well. So uh, please be in touch speculatively if you're brilliant and our mission speaks to you. Yeah, I think you've made a great case for it on this. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, thank you. stay in touch. Speak soon. Thanks so much, Richard. Bye-bye. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.